If you're like me, you spend lots of time pouring over maps, looking at weather data, all in an effort to help predict when and where my best times to hunt will be. It'd be nice if there was a reliable source with all this information in one place. Enter the Spartan Forge app. Unlike some other predictive apps on the market, Spartan Forge was created from military combat intelligence experience tailored for hunters and stands at the nexus of machine learning and white-tailed deer hunting. No more man-made algorithms. This is a predictive model based on real GPS collared deer data, historical and predictive weather, and the next level of mapping imagery, all at my fingertips. I've been using the iOS app this season, and it has replaced all my other mapping tools. Visit SpartanForge.ai and sign up today, or head to your iOS or Android app store. Use the promo code TRUTH to save some money and download it today. Mobile hunters, if you're interested in upping your mobile game, then head to tetherednation.com and check out their saddle gear. There are a few things you can actually buy that will help you become a better deer hunter or give you the freedom to hunt any tree or any situation. This is the reason why I started saddle hunting in the first place and why I use Tethered's gear. I can honestly say that Tethered's saddle gear has changed how I hunt for the better. Big tree, little tree, from the ground, it doesn't matter. I'm untethered by my gear to hunt the best setup for the situation, instead of hunting for a tree that my gear can use. My current core setup consists of the Phantom Saddle, Tethered One Sticks, and the Predator Platform, along with an assortment of their accessories. So if you want to up your mobile game, head over to tetherednation.com. Welcome to the Truth From Stand Deer Hunting Podcast, brought to you by Spartan Forge. I'm your host, Clint Campbell, and you're listening to episode number 337. Today, I'm joined by Matt Zernsack from The Push Archery to talk about how to transition to a traditional bow. So stay tuned. Hey, What is up, everyone? Happy Wednesday to you. Hope you're doing well. Hope you are feeling fine. Hope you had a nice uh, nice weather weekend. We had a, a little bit of a pisser here on Saturday. I did manage to get out and do some deer work, though. It was, uh, it was one of those days where I was kind of on the fence. It was drizzly, kind of misty, rainy all day, um, but it wasn't hot. And so I ended up venturing out and did some, uh, did some deer work. Got a couple cell cameras kind of freshened up, you know, made sure the... Uh, the solar panels were all kind of charged up, ready to roll, put fresh batteries in them. So those that I set yesterday should be good for the um, should be good for the year. And then did a little poking around in that area because the one area was where I had had uh, the encounter with the, the, the my target buck last year, well, the past two years. And so I did a little additional poking around and I kind of knew last year after I had that encounter that I needed to find a different tree. Like I needed to be, and it wasn't like a big change, you know, and I, I know, you know, I've talked to, my buddy Greg Litzinger a lot about this, you know, finding the spot. Well, I've talked to a bunch of guys about this, but finding the spot within the spot, you know. And so I've hunted this spot for a couple years, and typically it's always been the same kind of general area, same same tree or a tree very close to it. Um, and it's just uh, that time of year, depending on how the deer are coming in, you know, I've, I've I guess I've hunted it enough now to where, you know, does might come in behind you, um, but typically every buck that I see kind of comes from, you know, I guess my what would be my West and slightly from my North. Um, and so, you know, it, it, in that kind of general area, it gets pretty, it gets a lot more brushy and I'm typically where I'm set up is, is a little closer to like the, the scrape. I'm, I'm playing like the John Eberhart method of, you know, setting up close to the destination spot where I want that deer to be, or where I think that deer is going to be or where he's going to move to. But what I've ended up seeing the past couple years, especially last year, was like I had a buck bedded at 40 yards downwind um, of that scrape where he just laid there and was sent checking that scrape for a couple hours and, you know, without ever having to come to it. And I know I've talked to a bunch of different guys about that, whether it's the Nathan Killens, because I know he he will set up off of scrapes, like trails to scrapes. Uh, My buddy Moose does the same thing. Um, And so last year I kind of got – that happened to me. And so I knew this year I needed to kind of change trees. So the plan going into kind of, you know, uh, re-up the cameras or fre- freshen up the camera in that area, I knew I needed to kind of find a different tree. Now, I've tried to hunt a different tree in there, and it's just the particular tree I tried to get into was just a bitch to get into. And it just – it was a miserable hunt. I ended up getting into it, but it was just uh, it was just bad all the way around. So yesterday I went in. I did a little investigating, you know, walked back through the area where I knew that that buck was bedded, kind of was figuring out how he was getting in and out of there. I was figuring out how the deer were kind of getting from, 
you know, the West to like the, this, the area where I was actually set up. And, you know, the nice thing about this time of year, especially with all the rain that we had yesterday, um, or just in general this spring, you know, it was really clear um, how they were kind of getting in and out of there, what kind of route they were using. And so I kind of used that to my advantage and picked out a tree um, that kind of splits the difference. You know, I'm probably only maybe 30 yards from the tree that I originally had hunted um, historically, um, but it puts me that much closer in the game because where that scrape is, it starts to open up just a little bit. I mean, there's a ton of cover in this area, it's, and it's thick, especially, you know, the October time frame. But where that scrape is located, it does start to open up just a little bit, and so they become a little bit more leery as they're kind of approaching it. And, they're, and, and as I've watched them approach, like they're way more calm as they're kind of getting to it, if you will, because that's kind of where it's super thick, and there's like this little turn that they have to make to kind of come into that area, and that's exactly where the tree is that, that I'll be, um, be likely using this year. Now, the only bummer is, is it's a little bit of a funky tree to kind of get into. Um, so I kind of examined, you know, what side of the tree I need to kind of get in on, um, and things of that nature. Cause it does have a little bit of a lean to it and stuff like that. So I think I have that spot a little bit more dialed in. So that's like the first setup. The second setup is if I, if I don't see what I like there, there's one other tree <clears throat> that's just a little further in the cover. The only downside is, is that, um, you know, I guess the positive will be they'll be coming out of some really thick stuff and popping out and they'll be kind of on top of me. I should be able to see them though because the canopy is kind of low. Um, but when they when they are there for a shot, they will be on top of me. Um, and it's just, I'm going to be naked in that spot. It's a small tree, um, not a whole lot of cover, you know, break up in the sky for me and stuff like that. The, the tree, the first tree I was talking about has, you know, good breakup. It's a, got a couple different trunks on it, so I should be good there. But if I have to make a tweak or a move, um, I'm going to be kind of hanging myself out to dry a little bit, but that'll kind of be the Hail Mary spot. That'll be if nothing has shaken loose yet at that point, um, that'll be the tree that I move to. And, uh, and, uh, we'll see if we can't, uh, push the envelope and, and make something happen. But speaking of, trail cameras. I want to make sure you guys are aware my buddies over at Exodus are having their eighth uh, year anniversary sale. They've been in business for eight years. I've been, you know, buddies with them and they've done stuff with the show basically since, you know, since their, uh, since their inception. So if you've been eyeing any of the Exodus products right now will be the time you want to pick them up starting. This started on May 19th. So it started last week. Um, you can save 25% off the entire Exodus website. That's a deal that will also include savings for the first 300 Exodus renders and the first 300 rival cameras. So if you're thinking of getting a cell camera, cell camera bundle, then you need to take advantage of, of, of this opportunity. This is their biggest sale of the year, you know, in comparison to their black Friday sale that they do. So the good news is, is if you miss out on those savings, you can lock in the 25% savings off the entire site. If you miss out on getting a camera, it's still good on everything on the website until June 12th or while supplies last. So all you have to do is use the code TFTS at checkout to unlock the savings. That, that code again is TFTS to save 25% off the entire site. Uh, at Exodus, exodusoutdoorgear.com. So in case you need to become more familiar with Exodus, what they have to offer, I'll give you kind of the Cliff Notes version of what they got going on. The uh, the Exodus renders their flagship uh, ca uh, cell camera. It's powered by the Verizon 4G LTE technology, boosts uh, or boasts the lightning fast transmission times, making it one of the speediest in the industry. Plus, it's incredibly user-friendly and dependable, ensuring the products work flawlessly when it matters most. You can save up to $125 on purchasing the Exodus render security bundle when you use the code TFTS. So be sure to head over to excessoutdoorgear.com, take advantage of this savings opportunity, get those cameras out in the timber, and then you'll be all uh, you'll be all primed for uh, to watch some velvet pop from the comfort of your own home. So if you uh, forget the code, I'll also put the uh, the link to the savings in the show notes of this specific podcast. So with that, we're going to go ahead and jump into today's show. Have my buddy Mister uh, Matt Zernsack from the Push Archery. So. If you've been listening to this podcast, at least, you know, if, if you're new um, and you've been listening maybe since the early winter, I've started kind of dabbling with shooting in a recurve again. And I have a real kind of desire to 
add the recurve into my repertoire. Again, I don't know if this is the year that I'll make the transition fully, um, but it's something that I want to do and I want to get more familiar with. Um, and so I've been kind of, you know, poking around, looking at different bows, reading about, you know, making the transition to traditional archery. And uh, Matt at the Push Archery has an awesome resource center when it comes to traditional traditional bow hunting. I would say it's second to none. I mean, if, if, you, if you have a question about traditional archery, the push archery is the place to go to, to, to get your answers. And so since I've been kind of poking around and I had a bunch of questions about making the transition to traditional archery, you know, there's just, uh, it, it, there's, I won't say that there's a lot that goes into it because I don't want to scare anybody off, but there's, there's a lot to consider, I guess is, is one way to put it. And so we cover everything from, you know, different types of bows and, and what someone might be more comfortable with moving from a compound to a traditional, uh, to a traditional bow, uh, we talk about arrow setup and tuning arrows and uh, aiming versus instinctive shooting and different grips, you know, whether it's, you know, split finger or three under or whatever the case is. These are all things that I have questions about and I'm trying to kind of be, become familiar with as I start to kind of make this venture into the uh, the rabbit hole that is uh, traditional archery. I'm stoked to make the, you know, to start making the transition and spend more time with some traditional equipment. Um, but I have yet to let go of the compound uh completely. So with that, we'll go ahead and just jump into today's show. And as always, thank you all for listening. All right, folks, welcome back to another episode of the Truth From The Stand Deer Hunting Podcast. Today, I have on a fellow who we were just kind of talking offline before we got started that we should have done this a long time ago. We're both from Pennsylvania, but uh, Matt from The Push is the guest today. What's going on, man? What's up, Clint? Dude, we finally did it. I know, dude. It feels like, we were just saying, it feels like a long time coming. I've been kind of, uh, you know, from afar kind of watching what you had going on. We were talking, my buddy's been kind of pushing me more toward like yeah. traditional <laughs> stuff for like a couple of years. And traditional so archers kind of, tend to do that pretty well. Yeah, Try, yeah. A little pushy on trying to get you to pick up a recurve and longbow, I'm sure. Right, right. And so <laughs> I've been kind of like paying attention, you know, and we have a couple of mutual buddies and stuff like that. And so this just kind of felt like the right time as I've been kind of dabbling a little bit more. I was like, you know what? I was like, I just need to reach out and have him on. I was like, cause I've got a lot of questions yeah. and truthfully, it feels like it's just like it feels like the traditional equipment thing is picking up a lot of steam just in general oh, yeah for sure you know, I'm, yeah I'm we're seeing a lot more the, people being the, interested upswing. yeah mm -hmm. for sure yeah you're exactly right but how are things going in uh in western pa man what's new and exciting in your world oh man just uh i got a basketball team full of kids pretty much uh and uh we're just running everywhere it's spring soccer season so it's every weekend we have a tournament or games everywhere me and my wife are kind of passing each other as we're going to different sides of the county running kids so that's yeah. that's pretty much my spring my spring yeah. spring and summertime is running kids around for sure nice man i can't imagine uh having a basketball team load of kids i have one <laughs> and just getting her from place to place yeah, right. is, is 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 enough right yeah. it's like i feel like even with just one like my wife and i are like ships passing in the night along with sure. my daughter we're all like and then it seems like 8.30 is like the time where it's like everything converges back onto the house. And then it's That's like right. Yeah, you're exactly right. Showers, eat, boom, everyone to bed, you know? <laughs> like that's yeah, like what happens. Yep, absolutely. But uh, how's the uh, how's the offseason been treating you, man? You've been getting, even with all the running around, like still getting some work oh, yeah. in? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I 100% always prioritize shooting my bow. And it's good. It's a, it's a family event. So when I'm out shooting the bows, the boys are out there with me and uh, shooting shooting arrows slinging them down at the 3d range it's it's nice it's accessible it's it's nice having a decent range at the house that you can just step out the garage and and get a get a good session and get a lot of reps in and it you know I, I, you know how it is right busy busy you're busy so anytime you're stepping outside having the bow hanging there by the door just squeaking even if it's 10 arrows that's enough you know yeah. I, i'm just addicted to shooting the bow so definitely definitely making time for that absolutely nice man how about any any scouting getting out finding any uh any setups for next year exploring new yeah. ground Yep. So I'm, I'm, uh, I haven't done too much door knocking yet. I'm coming into door knocking season, which is one of my favorite seasons. We might talk about that later, but, um, uh, right now I'm kind of in the, in the mode of like weed whacking some trails and just doing some maintenance stuff on the properties that I do have access to. I haven't got any trail cams out just yet. Uh, but I am seeing a lot of good sign just deer numbers are up in the area over the last five, six years. So it's continuing to see the same trends. So I'm get pretty, get, getting pretty excited for the, nice. for the fall here for sure. Yeah. I finally just started getting the, uh, it's usually about this time that I start getting the itch. You know, I do oh, yeah. a pretty good yep. job of kind of putting things away. Like after, you know, January ish, I still, I hunt some late season and stuff like that, but at that point I've spent all my, uh, my goodwill at home, <laughs> you know, yeah. between yeah, your brownie gone. points are gone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I got to start filling the jar again at that point. Sure, so I, I'm yeah. able to sneak out a little bit once in a while. Um, you know, and, but then this time of year 
when I go ahead and start getting trail cameras back out, have a couple cell cameras hung and I start seeing velvet pop, especially in some areas that are kind of newer to me that I know I have some really good deer just from the historical of what I've done the past two seasons on this piece, just like scouting and mm -hmm. hunting it a little bit, but just taking really two years to try to learn as much as I could about the piece and have a couple really good deer that I've been kind of keeping tabs on. And I yeah. finally think I've figured out like honed in a little closer to where they're wanting to spend daylight hours and uh, right. have a trail camera hung on this like community oh, scrape nice. that I found. And it's like, it's getting hit every day still at this point. And I'm starting to see velvet show up and there's one in particular oh, that's yeah, showing nice. up and he's got such a head start on everybody. And I'm like, Oh man, I think yeah, cause it's in the right area. You know, yeah, it's like where yeah. we think we know, like we've backtracked him like with cameras over two years. Sure, like, yeah. you know, and I think, that's cool. I think this is where he's at. And so every day I get up and kind of check. Cause it's like, I mean, I know I'm probably like a solid like month and a half out before I can tell right, yeah. the antler characteristics. True, yeah, truly what, identify, sure. Right, right. But still, and maybe that's even better that I don't know because at least then I have the hope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. right. Yeah, this time of year is a lot of fun. I, I like squeezing and scouting along with groundhog hunting. So I, I'll sneak around the farms and the properties with my bow and, you know, you, you kind of get to know the properties and know where the groundhogs, mm -hmm. the holes are and everything. That's a really good way to keep yourself honed. Sneaking up on a groundhog is pretty tough. Their eyesight's ridiculous. Yeah, and um, added, added benefit. Yeah, added benefit is you, you know where the groundhog holes are so you don't step in and break away. <laughs> yeah, so exactly. that's the, the added benefit. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> nice, man. So how was your season last year, man? How, would, uh, how did it everything shake out for you? Yeah, it was good. I, I shot a buck and two does. Uh, I put an arrow into a third doe. Um, just, just crazy. The film of it is, is really a head scratcher. Uh, how, how we didn't, uh, recover her within, you know, 50 yards is beyond me. Um, uh, but other than that, it, it was just a super exciting season. Um, a lot of early season harvest this year. Nice. I, I kill a lot of my deer and, uh, we, I I'm lucky enough to, to live in a, a wildlife management unit here in Pennsylvania that opens up two weeks early. Um, so I'm in that, you know, Pittsburgh area, the larger, greater Pittsburgh Metro area. Uh, so I get to start earlier than, than a lot of my bow hunting friends. And I usually get a lot of my, um, a lot of my killing done in that, that first two weeks. So no different than this, this past season. Um, that's pretty historical two, three does early on in the season. And then you just kind of focus your attention on bucks. Yeah. And nice. That's pretty, it was a pretty standard season for me. Nice. Yeah. I, uh, I live in one of those units too, where I think, what was it last year? I think it was like the 19th. I want to say. Yeah. It was so that nice. It? Yeah. It's, yeah. it is it's like the only kick in the pants that I have though, is like, there's just no solid, um, like destination food source on any of the pieces that I have access to. So oh, it's interesting. Okay. Like, yeah. So it, it's almost like, I don't have as defi as definitive a pattern that time of year mm -hmm. as I would maybe like to, you know, and, and like the one year that I was really on a, a good one. And I talked about this before I screwed it up. I was just way too, I was way too passive with him. I should have went in and been a little bit more aggressive because I had him pretty much dead to rights for probably like four days straight. And it was in that early season time frame, but the oats yeah, yeah. had dropped and it was just like a pile of them outside of where I thought he was bedding. And so gotcha. every morning he was there like at seven 30, you know, for like three or four days straight. Right. And, uh, I was just like, no, no, no. That's kind of like, it's, that's too intrusive. I'm going to screw this up. Like, you know, he'll start venturing a little further <laughs> away to where I don't have to get as tight to bedding, you know? Yeah. And then we, we were like ships passing in the night, the rest of the season. It was like, right. I would be there at a spot, you know, in the evening. And then he would show up the following morning at like daybreak. You know, it mm -hmm. was like that the rest of the season. Dude, that's like, heartbreaking. Seasons yeah. like that are absolutely heartbreaking where you just can't can't connect it. And you're like, oh, damn it. Why can't I, I catch up I to know, you? I know. I <laughs> know. And now I'm like, now the early season, I just go for broke. I'm like, whatever. Yeah, if I know dude. there's a deer somewhere, I just go. <laughs> I know. And so I, I've been I've been doing that too, right? I, I, have, I have five boys, right? That's how many mm -hmm. kids I have. And fall is also a really busy soccer time. We're, we're kind right. of a soccer family. So that mid October time frame, I think last season I went three weekends in a row of tournaments. So wow. it's like, I got to hit it hard in that September time frame, And that's what I do. I, I do. I go for broke. I dive into those bedding areas. I, I don't like mess around anymore. Right. I just go in hard. And, uh, and that's, that's primarily my tactic these, these days. Nice, man. So, uh, how did that, uh, how did the buck play out that you killed? That was, yeah, all was PA, good. right? Yeah. All PA. Yeah, it was, it was good. Um, I, uh, I had tabs on two really nice deer on one of my properties that I have permission to, to hunt. And, um, and it, I, I had footage from, uh, so I'm trying to think how this went. So in the morning, I went up for a morning hunt up on the property right up behind my house. And I saw one of my target deer moving with, with a smaller, smaller buck and they went into bed, saw where they were bedded down. I didn't watch them bed down, but I know the area they're in. And so I made a play. 
and it was pretty early in the season. It was like first first week. So I, I made a move and I moved in really tight to where I saw them enter in this betting area and for the evening hunt and this buck comes out and it was the, it was the smaller of the two but I, I have an itchy trigger finger man and so when that deer <laughs> came in and just he gave me such a beautiful quartering away shot at like 14 yards and just pinwheeled him and he didn't make it maybe 70 yards and, and piled up it was it was just like picture perfect nice. first week of october it was awesome yeah you can't beat that dude don't look a gift horse in the mouth you know dude i, mean? I know i know he's sitting he's right behind me actually i just picked up the euro mount i'll just show him oh here. nice yeah there sweet he's right there, there. Nice. Yeah. Heck yeah, that's a good buck, man. Yeah, oh, yeah, dude. I'm, I, I, I'm, I ain't passing him. Like, I know, right? <laughs> itchy trigger finger or not, he's getting. I know, yeah, he's exactly. Carbon, it's just right? one of those things where it's like I saw him go in and bed down with this other buck earlier, right? Like right. just six hours earlier, and he steps out. The smaller one steps out, and it's. I'm watching. I kept watching the trail behind him. I'm like, oh man, the big one's gonna be coming out. Come on, he's coming with him. And by the time right. the shot was imminent, he wasn't. The big one wasn't in sight. So, right. <laughs> you're getting an arrow. Yeah, that it was the old canary in the mine shaft trick. He's like, "Hey, won't you go out and check this area?" Yeah, right, me, bud. Exactly. Like, yeah, tell me if it's safe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> nice. So, uh, what you got going on this uh, this upcoming season, man? Like, what are you? What are your plans? I'm PA, of course. I'm sure is still yeah. happening. Are you going <clears throat> any other states or anything like that? You're PA, Ohio, and yeah, PA, Ohio, and potentially West Virginia. I'm staying pretty local. You know, nice. within a two to two and a half hour radius. Um, yeah, I, I'm right now. It's just like more you you know how it is just being super busy with with uh, you know having a brand a side gig going on and you know yeah. kids and whatnot it's just getting more and more busy so i'm going to do a lot of my travel hunting and destination hunting later on in life right now yeah. i'm just fo really focused in on i am and i am really obsessed with with whitetails like pennsylvania ohio like west virginia whitetails is just i don't know what it is but it's got a stranglehold on me if someone were like Hey, you could be a generalist and go out and hunt caribou and, and bear and elk every single year, or you can have access to really good whitetail like encounters and whitetail habitat. Dude, I, I pick the whitetails uh, all the time, man. Like you 10 times out of 10, my buddy, Chad, and I kind of talk about this all the time. Cause he's gotten bit with the elk bug real bad. And I love going mm -hmm. out. I went out elk hunting last year. You know, the plan is I have like a. I have a Western plan that I essentially accrue points, you know, and I, ha I work with a group that yeah. helps me like do that so I can map things out. And I think next year will be the first year that I could actually start drawing in a Western state for a different species every year, like basically in perpetuity. Um, and, uh, and this year I didn't even try to go elk hunting this year um, because I'm bit with like, Kansas whitetails is like my thing right now. Oh, like, nice. That's the thing yeah. that like, I just love. And it's, <laughs> it's a draw tag. Right. It's not in incredibly hard to get. Um, but you know, if you have a point, you're basically guaranteed. If you don't have a point, it's kind of a crapshoot. Gotcha. Um, but I always kind of tell them like, I'm just kind of enthralled with like mm -hmm. hunting whitetails on the ground. I was like, yep. and whether I was like, if it's I money, dude. don't get Kansas is like, I would almost want to just go to Nebraska <laughs> and hunt like right. Southern Nebraska. You know, I was like, so I, I don't know that. And this is the first year, like, so I put in for Kansas. I don't have a point, so I may or may not get it. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is the first year that I might not travel in some years to where it's like, there's this North piece in PA where there's just really great caliber deer. And I think the little dirty secret, you know, and maybe it's not as much of a secret as that you, as, as we maybe think that it is, is that PA has got some really good deer, like way better yeah. than what people get, give it credit for. Yeah, and I just hope it continues sure. to be under the radar, you know, <laughs> cause, cause they're, I mean, we shouldn't even mention it probably with the podcast. Yeah, I was, was going to say, that. <laughs> it's not a good start. Not a bad start. Um, <laughs> but you know, and I'm finding that I'm finding that caliber of deer, here that i was finding in in ohio in ohio from like the time i used that i first started going to hunt it to now it's like the pressure just so much more that i almost feel like some of these like more wilderness areas in pa actually give me the better opportunity now i might not have as much of a target rich environment as i have in ohio sure but the i have i have less out of state pressure that i'm having to deal with in some of these really large areas it's like even the local pressure is manageable especially whenever you're mm -hmm. talking like archery season Oh, sure. So yeah, this might yeah, be the exactly first year right. that, that my travel hunt is actually just two hours North in PA. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> yeah. might be what yeah, you're going to get a lot more stand time. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Not going to be a whole lot of ground hunting on that trip. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. So man, how did you, uh, ultimately, how did you get into hunting? I mean, are you PA born and raised? Or was it kind of a heritage <laughs> yeah, thing? Well, I, uh, I, I moved around the East coast growing up, but I kind of landed in, uh, the, the Western PA area, my freshman year in high school. And, I was outdoor. I was, we, I grew up in an upland bird, um, family. Okay. And so small game was, was always part of, you know, the, the yearly 
outdoors and um, really enjoyed that. And then I was your standard weekend warrior from a, from a rifle hunting perspective. I'd, I would get up, go out on the old, you know, the, on the hundred acre family pr- property, sit in the same stand on opening day of rifle season. I did that all through high school and early college years. Um, but then I got into my, my buddies when we were, when we started college and we were starting to come back during the summertime, we would always go to a local bow club here called Oneida bow hunters, uh, in Butler, Pennsylvania. And it is just a awesome, like backwoods, um, outdoor course. And they had a summer league where dollar beers, you walk around <laughs> with a six pack and you're just cutting your teeth on bow hunting. You're talking to all these guys that have just so much knowledge and decades of experience. Um, and my buddies were going there and I couldn't go cause I didn't have a bow. I wasn't into archery at the time. So I told my, my wife, she was my fiance at the time, like, Oh man, I'm really interested in archery. Cause so I can go and hang out with, and it was her brother and her cousin were my best friends. And I'm like, so I can go hang out with Trav and Kurt and on Tuesday nights, I just felt left out. And I'm like, but you know, recurves are kind of cool. And that following Christmas, she surprised me with my first bow. And the re- only reason why I thought, like at that time, it's funny how I got on this path. The only reason why I thought recurves were cool at the time was because her brother and her cousin at the time were shooting. And this is like 2003. Mm-hmm. Her brother and cousin were shooting like 1980s Hoyts, <clears throat> like the like some of this old equipment. And every time I was with them on the family farm and whatnot, and they were shooting their bows, like shit was flying off their bows. Cams were blowing up, like all kinds of crap was happening. And I'm like, dude, these things are dangerous. And that was like my <laughs> first introduction to archery. And so that's why I went like the more simplistic route. It had nothing to do with like being traditional or, or any other reason. It's just purely because I, like my buddies showed me a really bad side of like some really old equipment. And that's what I just thought like modern archery was at the time. So it's right. pretty funny. Nice, man. So so you, so you, you know, PA around like ninth grade got into archery mm-hmm. because you had some close friends and family members that were kind of, you know, doing this, you know, weekly thing you wanted to be part of. When did, when did you start the push and how did all that kind of come about? Um, so that's a really good question. So all through my first, you know, foray in, in archery, um, I had a really tough start dude. And a lot of people have the same story to where you pick up a bow and and whether you're converting from a compound and coming over and dabbling in traditional archery, or you're picking up a a recurve or longbow for the very first time. And that's your first exposure to the sport. I I just, there, the information at the time in that 2003 timeframe just wasn't there. Um, we didn't have any awesome DVDs available just yet. You had to go to four or five different online forums just to get enough information to think you're on the right path to buying the right bow and picking the right arrow and taking the right approach to shooting a bow. And then anytime you asked a question on those online forums, it would start World War III on the forums and you didn't know who to believe. So it was just so frustrating that the information wasn't there. And I struggled, man. Like I had, and I'll I'll say this, I missed clean miss 11 deer. The first 11 deer that I shot at with a recurve, I missed them. I killed my 12th on the ground at 12 yards. It was like one of the greatest things I I ever accomplished after two years of just failing and failing. And I've always been sneaky in the woods. I've always been able to get into that red zone of these deer on the ground, up in a tree. It's just a knack I have. So I I just fit, you know, the weapon fit me, but I just couldn't shoot the damn thing. Like I was like missing (laughs) every single time. And, And I had an MO, man. I would miss high. I'd miss like three inches high, clean over the back every single freaking time. So after 11 misses, like that's super frustrating. And so then once I finally broke through, like the waterfall kind of started, right? I started getting more proficient and learning and cutting my teeth on bow hunting and like learning how to keep my shit together in the moment of truth. And then, and then as I started getting better and better, some more of my buddies started coming. And so I started taking them under my wing and kind of showing them what I've learned the previous four five, six years. Uh, and that's kind of where the push kind of started. Uh, Tim Nebel was interested. He was a huge bow hunter, bow hunted all his life with compounds. And he was like, Hey, I'm, I'm ready to take the leap. I want to come over and give traditional archery a try. And so I took him under my wing, like I had done to 20, 30 people before him and kind of brought him through the process, showed him aiming techniques, showed him all the different equipment. You could see the bows in the background behind Mm me, um, and kind of showed him everything he needed to know. And then I let kind of let whoever I'm helping kind of guide themselves. Oh, I like wood bows. I like a shorter bow. I really like the idea of shooting with this approach and this maybe aiming method. And then I kind of tailor their equipment and tailor their approach to, you know, their desires. Um, and 
at one point, I forget when we were talking about it, as he was kind of getting, you know, in the two dealage, if you will, under what I was showing him and stuff. He's like, man, we should, we should do something. And the idea came out like he was really good at video editing and video production. And I, I knew that I knew the content. So we just put together a video and honestly, dude, we had, we had no desire to create a brand or do anything. It was just a frustration level that my good buddy didn't have a resource that he had to have someone like me to, to get him into the sport. And there wasn't a resource that got somebody comfortable enough and confident enough to lay down their compound and give a recurve or a longbow a try or try archery if they had no exposure to compounds right. before that. So we put together this film. It turned out to be a two hour long film and it had everything you needed to know soup to nuts about traditional archery, all the different types of bows, all the different types of arrows, every aiming method, tips and tricks, whatever you need to know. And uh, we kind of put it out there and <laughs> just, just whatever, let's see how this thing does. And, and it kind of went like viral. Well, as viral as you can in a traditional archery community, right, that's right, right. like a super small niche community. Um, but it's about to hit 2 million views now, you know, wow. you know, seven years later. Um, and, uh, and, and it's great. And it's, and it's been, it's been super well received. It has thousands of comments on it of people just like this helped me so much finally have the confidence to walk in the woods with my recurve i killed my first deer this year it's just it's really rewarding and that's kind of where the the push started and, and our mission statement was to help expedite the traditional archery learning curve and that's right. that's literally our mo that's what we do right that's awesome man because it's um and we're going to dive into this a little bit because i am i am exactly your um target audience you're the right poster now. child i'm the poster yes. child. we talked we like, talked a little bit before we started recording i'm like oh yeah clint like you're the guy like you're yeah. that you're that guy yeah yep. yeah because you know i've been down the rabbit hole of of youtube you know my buddy our mutual friend mike verde he he, he and i have talked back and forth about you know shooting traditional you know he he doesn't, he's not super pushy. He's a pretty chill guy. Right. So he's not super pushy. Yeah. He's cool, dude. Yeah. yeah. He's been on the show. Yep. Absolutely. But, uh, you know, we call him, mur we call him murder ink. Murder ink. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. But he's, you know, every time we've talked, he's been like, dude, he's like, you're going to love it. Like just, if you give it a try, you're not going to want to do anything else. Like, it's just, you know, you're going to, you're going to love it. And then my other buddy, Todd, same way, you know, he's like, you just need to try it, you know, and he's kind of been bringing me along. And so finally, so long story short, it was like the first, when I first started archery hunting, the first season I archery hunted, I archery hunted with a recurve. That no, was like my first, yeah. So that was my first and that's, and that's super unique. Like that's not, that's not like a normal story. For right. Sure. Right. And, and the reason, do you remember what kind of bow it was? I still have it. It is a, uh, oh man, it, uh, it's the hunter series. Um, oh, I can't believe I'm forgetting it off the top of my head. It's a mass produced <laughs> bow, but it's a okay. known, it's a known company. I wish I could remember. What Darton Hammer, something like that, like Hunter series. Oh, if, Damon Hoyt. Damon Hoyt. That's what it is. Yeah, Damon okay. Hoyt. Yeah, that's cool. what it is. Um, and so the reason I started with the recurve is because so I didn't pick up bow hunting until I was like thirty. I hunted all my life, and my dad was never like a big bow hunter. Um, we always kind of hunted with guns, and so it wasn't until I was like thirty that I had a close friend of mine kind of, or a close friend of my father in law's kind of introduced me to it. Oh, my gotcha. dad. How old are you he, now, Clint? I'm forty five. Oh, okay. Yeah. So. So been at it like 15 years. Um, and when my dad bow hunted growing up, it was always with a recurve when he did bow hunt and it'd always be like October rainy or windy days. Cause he liked to spot and stock and try to sneak up mm. on him while they're bedded. That was his, that's how he liked to hunt. Sweet. And so archery was never like a huge thing in my family, but he would do it every so often. So that recurve was always kind of around. And so when I picked up archery, I was talking to my dad about it. I was like, yeah, I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to give bow hunting a try. And, uh, he had two recurves at the house, you know, and he was like, well, here, he's like, if you want to use one of these, go ahead. Of course he kept the 45 pound draw and gave me the 60 pound draw, you know, it's like, <laughs> so, you know, and, uh, right. so I took that and that was the first season and like, and it was my first season, like, and growing up, we never hunted in elevated stands. Like everything we did was still hunting and just hunting off the ground. Like we didn't have stands growing up or anything mm -hmm. like that. And so it was also my first time hunting in an elevated platform. And so I really struggled with the length of the bow being off the ground. Like it was all just really yeah. foreign to me. So I switched the following year to a compound and, and that was really why I switched the compound. It wasn't because I didn't like the recurve. I actually was an okay shot at it. I didn't know shit about what I was doing. Mm -hmm. My dad showed me a couple of things. It was like, Hey, it's like throwing a baseball. Like you were always good at throwing a baseball. So fling the arrow, like you're throwing a baseball. And I was like, okay, makes sense. You know, so I can do that. <laughs> yeah, I can do that. So yeah. I was okay out to like 20 yards, 
you know, I got that's like was kind of like my cutoff was like 15 to 20. As long as I'm good there, then I'll, you know, that'll be kind of like my effective range. Um, and then I just kind of use the compound, you know, all this, all this time since, but I've had to recurve at my house and kind of shoot every so often. And so this past year, I kind of picked it back up and started kind of actively using it, shooting it, you know, multiple times a week. Don't have an arrow kind of set up for it. You know, I was talking about, but just start shooting, just feel it. And then whenever you think you're ready to like make the move, like, let me know, we'll get you, we'll get you a correct bow. We'll get you an arrow set up, like all that stuff. Nice. But I'm also the type of guy that like, I also want to know what the hell I'm doing. You know what yeah, I mean? Right. So <laughs> that's where I was like, I was following you and I was like, I was like, sure. you know what? I was like, I just need to talk to Matt. I need to have him on the show. I need to ask him these questions because I've gone down the YouTube rabbit hole, you know, and you're right. It's like some guys like this, some guys like this. I was like, I just need a guy who knows, yep. ask questions. I'm sure there's a bunch of people that are listening to this that have the same questions that are right where I'm at, where they're like teetering, you know what I mean? And they just need the right information to help them make, make a decision. So this is perfect. It's awesome. Super Let's do it. <laughs> <All> <laughs> I'm right. excited. That's so, great. you know, if you're giving, so let's start with this. Like, let's take the person who's transitioning from a compound to yeah. traditional equipment. Like, what are a few of like the overall kind of guiding principles or some guidance you might give that person, not equipment wise yet, but just like general guidance that you would give a person that says, Hey Matt, I'm coming from compound this year. I think I want to move to a traditional bow. Just give me whatever your kind of like top line advice is before we even start talking gear. Okay, before gear. Before gear. Um, okay, so I guess the the first thing I, I know this is going to sound really really dumb, but I would say go to our YouTube channel and watch the first two hour film because it's going to give you a crash course on the entire ethos of traditional archery. It's going to show you every style of bow because when you start asking people at clubs or going online, you're going to hear so much different terminology that's foreign to you. It's going to be get real confusing. So if you just take the crash course, it gets you like introduced to all the things, traditional archery equipment, um, styles, approaches, and all that stuff. I think that's a really good place to start. And then from there, I would narrow down what like what speaks to you, what method speaks to you? Like, do you want to like have it be more of a feel type process? Mm -hmm. um, if you are a guy converting from compound, guys coming from compound, guys or girls coming from compound, they, they fall into two categories. One, they want to stay really close. They like, they look at these metal risered bows and, and that's really attractive to them. And they kind of, it's familiar to them. It's closer to their compound. It's more heavy mass weight, easier to aim with like those types of things. So they kind of want to gravitate towards there or they go the complete opposite end of the spectrum because they're running away from something, right? They want to go to the woods, wood bows, one piece bows, those types of things. And, uh, so I, I would say just understanding which person person you are at the beginning is going to get you going down the right path. Cause I would say, I would, I would say the first five years of dabbling in traditional archery is probably where you're going to spend the most money is because you're just constantly trying new things, new things, new things. Uh, so just being honest with yourself and, and trying a lot of things for free, going to rendezvous, talking to people, finding clubs. I think that's, that's good. Having a mentor that can be hands-on with you. Somebody like you have a friend is also big. So search for that person. You know, if you are interested in that search for that person that is really close to you, that can be hands-on. You can go to their house, actually put your hands on multiple bows, different types of equipment before you're making your first purchase. I think that's, there's nothing more disheartening than spending, even if it's a budget bow and you're getting into it for 300 bucks and then you spend another 150 on arrow setups and whatnot, there's nothing more disheartening than getting it outside and shooting and it's just not jiving with you. Whether you're not hitting right properly or just doesn't feel right or the but you're a little overbowed, that's just a waste of time, right? Mm -hmm. So being able to get your hands on, on bows or having somebody to mentor you is, is really big. Right. Um, and I think the and one of the big things is if, if you're just standing around at a club or you're at a party and somebody has a recurve to enjoy your experience a little bit more, it, I, there's this phenomenon and I don't know where it came from and why, why it happens. It just happened the other night at our summer league. You got a guy shooting a compound. He's standing up strong, standing up tall, like a man, right? Draws his bow back. He's in this perfect anchor position, runs a shot like a boss, just owning his equipment. And then you hand, and he's like, man, I want to try that recurve. I've always been interested. Let me, can I shoot your bow? Absolutely. The very first thing they do is they spread their legs wider than shoulder width apart. They squat like they're taking a shit, right? They bend their bow back and they're doing this crouching tiger, hidden dragon thing. And they're trying to do this like, you know, Indian peeking around a tree shot. And it's like, no, just the, the biomechanics of shooting a recurve 
are identical to shooting a, a compound. There's some slight nuances, but stand up like a man, right? Right. <laughs> Come back to a full, a full draw, a full repeatable anchor, a nice repeatable anchor, and run your shot with confidence. And I think that's, if you can just break that stigma right off the beginning, that you're not going to be shooting it that way, right? Stand up tall, shoot it just like your compound. You're going to get accurate way faster. I think you're yeah. going to, the confusion and the the misses and the, the ability for you to become proficient faster is going to be really beneficial right. for you. That That's funny that you say that because even just playing around with the recurve in the backyard, like I found myself like, <laughs> like doing that like you're saying why i don't understand yeah. it's it's crazy and i'm sure i did it too right i'm sure yeah i know actually i know i see pictures of me in my first couple of years and that's exactly how i shot a bow too just a super hunched over my bow's almost horizontal with the ground i'm just like completely yeah. hunched over so it's <laughs> just it's, like that's that's like one of the overarching like number one things the back to your question you asked like Stand up tall. If you're converting from a compound, shoot the recurve just like your compound. Yeah, it's shooting a bow, is shooting, a, shooting a bow at the beginning of it, right? That's right. Like that's the, and it's funny because when you said that, like I, I remember myself. I said to myself, I was like, man, why are you hunching over? Like, like why are you doing that? I was like, because I was I was wildly inconsistent. It's like sometimes it would land. I'm not consistent just in general, but it was just like the consistency that, that I did. Have, any consistency I did have went out the window. You know Smart. what I mean? Like I just couldn't get it. And then I was like, let me shoot this like I shoot my compound. You know what I mean? Yep. I was like, let me just Absolutely. stand up. Let me find a place to pull back and let me make sure the bow. I mean, I got to can it just a little bit so the air didn't mm -hmm. fall off. Yeah, yeah. Like, but otherwise, let me kind of stay where I need, I'm where I'm supposed to be and start ripping off shots. And then all of a sudden, it was like, I wasn't necessarily <laughs> yeah. on target, but my arrows were all landed in the same spot consistently. That's right. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, like, shooting a compound is just, it's holding back opposing forces, right? And you're, mm -hmm. you're using your skeletal structure. You're using mm -hmm. your larger muscles to, to run nice, controlled, repeatable movements and then you you have this muscle memory and you have this grooved with your compound and then you're you're not using any of that like you've spent decades investing in that muscle memory and then you're going to throw it out the window and and start fresh you're starting all over from the very beginning if you don't carry that over to the same style of form so that's one big um one big piece of advice that i give anybody that's trying to shoot a shoot a recurve coming over from compound is stand up tall shoot it strong Right. That's uh, interesting too. When you, <clears throat> when you had mentioned kind of like evaluating what you want out of the experience, mm -hmm. like that was big. Cause like for me, the two different people you described, like it, it landed. Cause I was thinking along the same lines. And for me, the traditional aspect of things is like, I am fat. I am in fact trying to run just in general in my life. I'm trying to get to things that kind of connect me with nature and the, mm. the way things are intended to be. So whether nice. that's like how I hunt, right. Mm -hmm. And wanting to move more to traditional equipment. Cause I want to be more connected. I want more of the intimacy or like doing jujitsu where it's like, I'm trying to be better connected to my body and like its capabilities and where nice. it works and where it doesn't work, you know what I mean? Right. And stuff like that. And so that's been like a big focus of mine, like probably for like the past year. And now it's bleeding over into my hunting where I'm like, I want that same connection in my mm. hunting, not to, nothing wrong with compound. Like, you know, I still sure. love shooting a compound, but mm -hmm. like, I want to get more intimate with it. I want my body to be part of it. You know what I mean? I want it to kind of like be a critical part of, of what I'm trying to do. Um, so let's go into like the first kind of thing people will think about. Right. So when you start thinking about bows, there's a bunch of different types, right? So I went down the rabbit hole of like looking at different bows and you know, what, what options there are. And so there's like, long bows, mm -hmm. there's recurves, there's one piece, there's take downs. Sure. Can you just give like an overview of like the different yeah. types of bows yeah, that are available? available. <laughs> For sure. Um, so just the, the main categories that pop up are long bows versus recurves. Um, so when you're looking at a strung bow from the side profile, a recurve kind of curves towards the target at the limb tips as it follows mm -hmm. up. And the string actually touches the belly of the bow. So the, the side of the bow that faces the archer the side of the limbs that face the archer is called the belly. And then the side that faces the target is called the backing of the limbs. So if the string touches the belly side of the, of the bow of the limbs, as it's heading towards the ends of the tips of the, the limbs, then that's a recurve that's classified as a recurve. And you can have super curves, ones that look like giant hooks. You can actually hang them on a, the branch of a tree. They're so hooky all the way to a very mild, uh, more conventional limb style. So that's the difference between a recurve and a longbow because a longbow does not. So it only mm -hmm. touches the limb at the very tip of the limb and the limbs are like kind of jotting backwards towards the archer. Um, it's more traditional feeling. Uh, typically, you know, it's 
10 years ago, I could sit here and say, man, longbows are typically quieter like, than recurves. Recurves have a little bit more performance than the longbows. But now with modern materials and modern sciences and people really digging into the uh, physics of like limb designs, I mean, there's some longbows and really heavily deflexed longbows that, and we can talk about that in a minute, but um, they're just, they're up there hanging with some of these recurves. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, th there is a reason. I mean, there is a reason that every Olympic archer that is professional archer, best in the world, competing for their countries, they're all using recurves. So for, they're there for pure performance, stability, accuracy, repeatability, right? It's the hardest game in the world. They're shooting 70 meters at a, wow. si a circle the size of a softball. Yeah. Um, and so recurves are going to be easier to shoot than, than mm -hmm. a longbow. Longbows are more difficult to shoot. Um, so from a, an equipment perspective, that's like your first big dividing line. But then there's a couple subcategories. There's the takedowns versus one pieces. Um, so bows can be a single piece. So they're laminated in a very large, like press and form, and they're just one piece bows, really traditional feeling, really cool looking. You can see this bear right here, this bear Kodiak behind me at the end of the rack. That's a one piece recurve, just a really cool looking bone right beside it is a one piece longbow. That's an Omega, uh, Omega Royal Huntsman longbow. Um, so really cool trad feeling. And so if you're one of those people that are really interested in the sport and are looking to go to like the far side of the traditional spectrum, one piece bows are going to be where it's at. It's just super cool. And probably one piece long bows specifically, um, really neat. And then if you want to go way off the deep end, then we get into like what we call primitive archery. And that's when you get into like self bows where the bow is actually carved out of a single piece of wood, uh, with no laminates and no glue. So that's, that's getting really traditional. Um, but aside from that, so that's the one piece bows, then you have two piece bows. So typically they, they break in the center of the handle. Uh, so when you unstring them, you can actually, there's like a bow bolt system. You can twist and pull them apart from each other. Really cool. If you're a traveling hunter, that's, they're really neat. Uh, and then there's three piece bows. And, and as I'm going through these categories, they're getting heavier in mass weight because you're having to put more, more material and reinforcements to be able to support the forces in these connections. Um, and you're also putting that metal hardware on the bow as well. So the, the mass weight of the bows are going up, the heavier the bow, the more stable it is and the more repeatable it is to shoot. Uh, so the last category is a three piece takedown bow. And that's kind of where I, I land. I land in the three piece. I typically always shoot three piece bows. Um, and those are, you can go in the wooden three piece bows, or you can go towards, uh, the more modern materials like G10 and Micarta. And you can see there's a bow here, this Wenger that's off behind me, this black and green one. It's made out of like a, a resin impregnated uh, uh, fabric material, layered fabric material like G10 or Micarta. So it's really, really dense, extremely dense, extremely strong, very hard on the boyers, uh, <laughs> band saws for sure to cut through that stuff. But it makes a wonderful bow riser. It's just, it's awesome. So it gives you like the benefits of a wood bow where it's not super cold in your hands during, you know, January bow hunts. Right. Uh, but also it has that traditional feel and it's real quiet and uh, it, it's really, really cool, cool materials. Uh, nice. What, uh, wh so why do you prefer the three piece? Is there a performance like component to it? Yeah. Yeah. For just for me personally, I'm, I'm, I really like the mass weight. I like a really heavy mass weight bow. Um, and then also there's the benefits when you're looking at a three piece bow out of the, all the categories, one, two, or three piece bows, the three piece bow allows you to, uh, kind of keep the same handle and then progress limbs as you start getting stronger. Because if you're, if you're a compound shooter and you're shooting, you know, a 85, 90% let off compound bow, and it's a 70 pound bow. Um, it's, I mean, I wouldn't recommend very much over 42, 43 pounds for your first bow. Um, right. from a recurve at your draw length. And so maybe that's something we can go to there. So bow, when you're looking at bows, if you're looking at the used market, cause there's a lot of bows on the used market. Um, you're going to see most bows are marked at 28 inches. So 28 inches of draw length. Um, and so you'll have a rating of let's say 40 pounds at 28 inches. Now with a recurve, it doesn't have a hard cam over stop from a draw check standpoint. So you can draw these bows for the most part, you can draw them any, any draw length. Right. So if you have a 40 pound bow at 28 inches and you have a 27 inch draw length, a rough rule of thumb is about two to two and a half pounds per inch. So if you were shooting a 40 pound bow and you were, it's rated 40 at 28 and you have a 27 inch draw length, you're going to be shooting 47 and a half pounds. 
Right. Cause I'm a 26 and a half. Cause that's one of the things I've been thinking about is actually one of the questions I had that was coming up was just like, where do you start with draw weight? And that makes yep. sense. Cause I'm a 26 and a half inch draw. So if I'm shooting, yeah, so you're probably, looking at three to three and a half pounds off of whatever it's marked at, assuming it's marked at 28 inches. Right. And so I probably want to shoot a 45 pound That's right. bow, I would imagine. Right. Roughly. Yep. yep. Yeah. You would, that would be a, like a really sweet spot. 45 to 47 pounds that gets you in that 43, 42 to 45 pound range at your mm -hmm. draw length. That's going to be, that's going to be the ticket as you're kind of moving, moving over for sure. Right. So yep. whenever someone's, and, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say, just to wrap up that thought with the three piece bow, so let's say you're wanting to just get into it. And so you're going to start shooting this three piece bow at 40 with a set of 40 pound limbs on it. And you can, if you're buying a bow from a boyer, um, that's making like these higher end custom bows, um, you can have them build you multiple sets of limbs that attach to your handle, uh, mm -hmm. which is really, really nice. And so nice. you can have a 40 pound set of limbs for the summertime for 3d shooting, but then you can have a 47 pound set of limbs for bow hunting or a 50 pound set of limbs. Um, and, and, and swap those out and you can still keep the same riser, the same feel, the same grip, everything stays the same there. Right. Um, and like, there's another big category of bows as well, like the metal riser bows. And that's kind of where I play most of the time. Uh, I do have an affinity for wood bows and you can see on the bow rack behind me, I have bows from 1960s all the way up until <laughs> made just la last year. And some look like spaceships. Um, right. but I, I, I enjoy a metal riser bow. Um, they come in a primary, the primary attachment system of them are, are ILF, which is called international limb fit. And so that's what all the Olympic archers are using. So all of like the Hoyts, the, the long 25, 27 inch risers that you see, uh, out on the market for that our Olympic archers are using, they're all using the same exact connection system. So there's a standardization of how the limbs attach to the risers. And what that enables you to do is you can shoot a Korean set of MK limbs with a US made Hoyt riser or a, a million other combinations from all these different manufacturers. And a really cool thing that started happening right around the 2010 point, like 2010 standpoint is they started taking these uh, design features of these 25 and 27 inch Olympic bows and bringing them into a compact 17, 19, 21 inch package and making them basically, uh, hunting rigs. And so right. now there's, uh, there is a ton of bows out there to choose from that enables you to have a, a bow length that's proper for, you know, tree stand hunting or maneuverability in the woods that gives you the tunability and the stability and the accuracy of, you know, the, their, longer cousins, the, the Olympic bows. It's, it's right. really nice. So, so how, how cause length is perfect segue. Cause length was going to be mm -hmm. my next question. It's just like, cause you know, the little bit of like looking around that I've been doing, it's like, you'll see typically what I've seen at least is probably like anywhere from like 56 to like 62 seems like a pretty like normal kind of length yeah, you're spot of, on. of bow. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming the advantage of a longer bow is probably stability, just like you would have with like a 34 mm -hmm. inch axle to axle compound exactly versus right. a 26 inch or 28 inch axle to axle or 30 inch axle to axle, whatever it happens to be. Right. Is that kind of like the standard? You're exactly right. Yeah. Like Olympic archers are shooting 70, 72 inch bows. Ooh. So there's, there's a reason yeah. why they're shooting bows that are as tall as them. Right. Um, so the longer the bow, the more stable you're exactly right. Um, however, the longer the bow, the less maneuverable it is when it's in the woods. Those Olympic archers aren't walking through and tucking down to brush and tracking deer through the gnarly Pennsylvania woods, right? Right, right, right. So, so um, but, but yeah, you're right. 50, 56 inch to 62 inch is, is what you're going to find on the used market a lot. Uh, 64 inch bows are, are also really popular from a hunting standpoint. And then you'll see 66 and 68 inch bows out there that the 66 and 68 tend to be like 3d rigs, mm. uh, maybe long, long bows that are more of a target style long bow. They're, they're designed for maximizing the points on your scorecard. Mm. Um, so that you will see those, but I'm over the years from a bow hunting standpoint, my bows have continued to get longer and my draw weight lighter. So hmm. right now, this past season, um, I'm, I'm maybe year number five of hunting with a 64 inch bow. Uh, that's just my preference. I, I just, I like shooting it. And I have a, I have a kind of a theory that when I look at the amount of arrows I shoot in a given year, I try to shoot a hundred to 150 arrows five days a week. And if you start looking at that math, it's like, that's like 20 to 22,000 arrows I'm shooting a year. Wow. And then when I look at the arrows that I actually shoot at an animal, 
maybe in a good season, it's six, seven, ten, depending on, you know, if I'm yeah. turkey hunting and shooting small game and shooting a deer. And it's like when you do the percentage, it's like 0.0001% of my arrows that I actually fire out of this bow I'm investing in are going to be in a hunting situation. The other 19,900 and whatever, 90 <laughs> right. arrows are going to be in my backyard or at the club or at the range shooting for points. Uh, right. So I want to maximize my enjoyment out of the rig that I'm shooting for the majority of the time. And so if I can get comfortable and it can be the most accurate rig for me, and it just so happens to be maybe two inches longer than it's, it's bow hunting category, quote unquote, air quotes, bow hunting category bow, I'm, I'm going to choose the longer bow, the lighter bow, uh, so I can just get ma maximum reps out of it and then really enjoy year round shooting my bow. And if I enjoy shooting my bow year round, I'm going to shoot it more. Yep. And I'm going to be more prepared for hunting season. And yep. I'll, I'll adjust my, my hunting situations around a slightly longer bow. Right. So I want to go back to just like long cur or uh, long bow versus recurve. And sure. Just un understand like, does one or the other handle like challenging angle shots better than the other? The only reason I ask this is because one of the guys who got me interested, and he doesn't know it. I mean, I've had him on the show and stuff before mm -hmm. is Jaron Scheffler, right? From okay. White Tail Adrenaline. Yeah. That dude sure. takes some of the craziest shots I've ever seen, like laying down <laughs> yeah. on his side and stuff like right, that. And right. he's using a longbow. And so I don't know this and I've never asked him, but I've always kind of wondered like, yeah, I'm sure he picked that up initially because that was just what he wanted to shoot. It felt good, sure. whatever the case is. But I'm curious now, I'm like, I wonder if like that type of bow actually handles some of those awkward shots that he finds himself in just by the style that he hunts and that fits better. Like, I don't, I don't know. Is there anything to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say from a nuanced standpoint, if I really had to like think through it, like, okay, I'm I'm on my knees um, next to a big oak tree that's pretty knotty and it has a lot of roots coming up out of the ground. In that situation, and maybe I'm like right behind a little knoll. In that situation, probably a longbow is going to be better for me because the tips like lay backward a little bit. So mm -hmm. if I'm shooting all things equal, if it's the same length bow, right? You know, tip to tip, my the recurve tips are going to be kind of more forward and would have a higher probability of maybe interfering or hitting one of those roots or whatnot on the ground. But I mean, but practically speaking, I do a lot of ground hunting and uh, a lot of running gunning. And I just have not noticed hmm. a, a major difference between when I carry a longbow versus a recurve in the woods. Okay. Interesting. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I, so just to wrap that up, I would, I shoot a recurve better than I shoot a longbow. Really? Um, so okay. I, I'll, yeah, I'll personally take the, the accuracy side of it over, you know, the, the one in 1000 situation when I'm in the woods and I'm like, Ooh, man, wish, right. wish I would have had a longbow there versus a right. recurve. I, but I will say when you're walking through the woods, a recurve catches so much branches and foliage <laughs> and stuff because it's right. like the, it gets between your string and your limb where a longbow, yeah. you don't get as much of that. So I right, will say right. that for sure. Nice. What, um, uh, so I'm guessing like you, people who are transitioning, like we'll use me as an example again, you know, are likely, are they most often kind of moving to a recurve because of all the performance things that you kind of had mentioned? I, I'm assuming too, that the recurve is quicker, right. And things like that. But. Yeah. It's, I mean, like I said earlier, it's, 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 it really doesn't matter, uh, from a performance standpoint in the, in the bow or in the bow hunting world, uh, from a traditional mm -hmm. perspective, like the traditional mm -hmm. bow hunting standpoint, mm -hmm. because these materials and things that are coming out now are just, these longbows are performing. They're super quiet. They're super fast. And, and honestly, a 45 pound bow with modern materials from a good boyer from a longbow or a recurve is going to kill anything in North America that you need it mm -hmm. to, as long as you know what you're doing from a tuning standpoint and you can execute your shot and put it where it needs to go. Um, so honestly, it's, I don't see a trend, whether they're coming to recurves or long bows more. I mean, if I really gun to my head, had to say which one I believed it would probably be recurves just because that's what people think about mostly. Right. Yeah. Um, however, I mean, it's just if, which which personality are you guy that's wanting to stay close to the compound side, but just dabble? Or are you going like hardcore to the other extreme? If you're if you're the second, then you're probably going to go towards a longbow. Yeah, see, and that's like that's where I think that that's where I'm at. <laughs> oh, dude, like longbows the, are so cool. I I know. get bit. I go I go through these longbow. I get bit by the longbow bug, and I'll shoot them. I'll dedicate myself to a summertime and I'll, and I just want to, I've never killed anything with a longbow. Every, every animal I've killed so far has been with a recurve because it's like, I mean, I have some fantastic top of the line, unbelievable performing 
one piece longbows on the rack behind me. It just, when it comes to bow hunting, it, like right when I'm at the decision point, like three weeks away from season, I'm like, all right, I got to down select. Like what rig am I going to hunt with this season? I just always default back to a metal ILF riser with some hooky, super efficient, uh, light ILF limbs. And that's just, right. that's kind of my, my thing. Nice. Yeah, it's a, and I imagine that. So, say for example, say I'm like, all right, I'm jumping into the game, I'm gonna mm -hmm. shoot a recurve, because um, maybe you know, in my mind, I'm like, yeah, I really want to make the longbow move, but the recurve feels like it's less of a move for me, just maybe even mentally, right? Not throw the physical com kind of component out of it, but mentally, it looks familiar and so maybe i shoot familiar you know what i mean like just playing the sure. mental game right yeah yeah that's a, yeah that's a, so the um so is there any if i were then to want to change and kind of switch to a longbow at that point is there any kind of difference in terms of shooting or is it like when you no. make the traditional jump like you're in the traditional game regardless <clears throat> of what bow you're picking up at that point well, I mean, I, I won't go that far, but I, I will say my to the sentiments of my one of my opening statements of stand up tall, shoot the mm. shot with strong form, bring your compound form over to the to the trad bow. That that all applies to everything we're we're talking about. Now, there are nuances between shooting a one piece long bow that might be an ASL style bow that's a little bit more critical for you to shoot, lighter mass weight. Um, you, you grip, you tend to grip those a little bit where you want to have a nice light open grip, just like on a compound with a, a heavier mass weight riser, mm -hmm. longbow or, or recurve. Um, there are some sm slight nuances depending on, you know, where your shelf is cut, like how far to center shot your bow is. And you might have to do some different things. Some bows, um, like my, the bow I'm shooting right now and I've been shooting for the last couple seasons, I shoot it more erect and it's maybe like with a five degree cant, but it's, it's definitely more of like a classic target archery form. It looks like, mm -hmm. uh, but whenever I get one of my longbows on my, in my hands that is not cut to center or not cut as far past center, you'll see my cant goes to like 15 degrees and Got it's it. just to get the arrow under my aiming eye because that arrow is like pointing to the left when the, when the bow is strung and you have the arrow knocked on the string because of the center shot. So you kind of have to cant the bow a little bit to get it pointing right down to the, the target right below your eye. So there are some like small nuanced things with your form and, and how you approach shooting the bow. But for the most part, nothing drastic, whether you're going to a long bow or recurve, like you wouldn't see me doing a big hunched over, like drastically right. different type of form between the d different bow types. Right. It sounds like more just like, spending some time with it just from a familiarity standpoint yeah like, each each know. one of them have different different temperaments. personalities they, they have different personalities yeah. you know you got to tame you got to team each, tame each beast and figure right. out what they like <laughs> right yeah so it was a nice segue there because you started talking about aiming and stuff like that and so that's one of the things that like even just playing around in my backyard was trying to like figure out like am i an aimer or am I mm -hmm. like an instinctive shooter in like, and I don't even think that I understand what the difference between the two is other than in my mind, I'm like aiming is, is like I'm holding a little bit longer and I'm trying to find something I can use as a wayfinder in relationship to what I'm trying to hit. And then instinctive, I'm doing it like I'm throwing a baseball from shortstop to first base where right. I'm picking a spot on the target that I want to hit. I'm yep. looking at it. I'm pulling the bow up and it's really, I'm just like the draw cycle is quick and it's gone, mm -hmm. you know? Yep. So can you talk a little bit about aiming versus instinctive and like, where sure. do you see people fall that are like newer to the game having more success? And maybe, maybe there isn't a, maybe there isn't like one or the other. Yeah, this is great. Great, great question. Um, so Joel Turner says it best, our good buddy, Joel, he says, it doesn't matter what type of aiming style you, you choose to use. All you're doing is setting the arrow on a trajectory path. That's it. That's all we're doing. And you're just deciding how you're wanting to do that. Are you going to allow your subconscious to do it, which is the more instinctive approach to where you're focused, you're not focusing on that arrow tip. You're just kind of staring at what, what you want to hit and you're kind of letting the feel of the shot. You're letting your subconscious set that sight picture. You kind of get this fuzzy green light in the back of your head. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, that looks right. That looks about good. And then you leave aiming and you transition into your shot activation. You move into execution phase and you run a strong shot. Um, to me, it doesn't matter if you're letting the subconscious set that sight picture, or it's more of like a feel of how that sight picture looks, which is the more instinctive approach, or you're taking a more dedicated aiming method. All you're doing is setting that arrow on a trajectory path. The way you shoot the bow should not change. Mm -hmm. So there is a stigma out there that, oh, I, I feel like I'm a more instinctive shooter. I shoot a little bit quicker. I bend over a little bit more. Like there's a stigma that there's a, there's a 
actual approach to shooting the bow, depending on whether you aim instinctively or you're like consciously sticking the tip of the arrow 12 inches below the target, because that's where, you know, you need to hit it. Mm -hmm. Um, so one thing that I caution people is as they're trying to decide how they want to approach shooting the bow, they should shoot the bow from a biomechanics perspective, the same, no matter the aiming method that they're dabbling with. Mm -hmm. Because once, once, your sight picture is set, whether you let your subconscious set it for you instinctively, or you are a hard dedicated aimer and you set that tip where it needs to go in both of those methods, you need to move off of the aim and then move into the execution phase of your shot and leave that aim behind. And that that's, that's big because a lot of people are, you know, one trap that people find with aiming where aiming doesn't work for them is because they are so engrossed in aiming and it's no different than a compound. I'm, I'm sure all, a lot of your listeners that, that shoot compounds right now are like, oh, yeah, but brother, I know exactly what you're talking about. When you're, when you're focused on your pin and where your pin is on that target, and that's the yeah. only thing you're thinking about, guess what? You, you're not rolling your, your hinge release. Mm -hmm. you're, not, yeah. you're not pushing through your button, your thumb button properly because you're so wrapped up in aiming. And that's a big um, pitfall from being a dedicated aimer with, with a tra trad bow is because you're, you're, when you're starting to dabble with it, you get so sucked into the aim, you start getting really yippy. You start shooting on when that sight picture looks good. So that's, uh, that's one caveat or that's one caution that I have for you, but there's a couple different aiming methods that I think will, uh, I, I can draw some analogies back to a compound. So the first style of aiming is, is instinctive aiming, just like you described. It's kind of like throwing a baseball. I still instinctively aim right now. Um, I still shoot instinctively at 10 yards, 15 yards. Maybe I really don't think too much about what I'm doing with the tip of my arrow. So I, I have a mixed bag of aiming tricks that I use depending on the situation. So instinctively it is, it is like a feel I draw back. I'm running my biomechanics. I get into a nice solid anchor. I look at the sight picture. I'm staring at the target. I'm focusing where I want my arrow to hit. And I just, I can see my hand and my bow kind of in the blurry periphery, but I'm not paying attention to it. I'm not saying, oh, it needs to go here. I'm just staring at the shot, staring at the point I want to hit. And then I just run my shot and the shot breaks and the arrow's going there. My subconscious is completely setting that sight picture for me. And that's what we would classify as instinctive aiming. If you have good hand-eye coordination, you're an athletic person, hey, that's that is a great aiming method. I've killed a pile of deer shooting instinctively, and there are some of the best bow hunters in the world shoot instinctively. I mean, their walls are filled with bucks way bigger than I'm ever going to shoot, <laughs> and they're shooting instinctively. So it is a completely viable, and, and there's there is like this this trend going on where aiming is being popularized. But I would just want to make sure that. I'm communicating properly that that instinctive aiming is a viable and very effective option. And it's just, you should have it in your bag of tricks. You should practice it. If you decide you want to be a dedicated aimer, practice shooting instinctive shots just so you have it for later. So you can get better at that hand-eye coordination and, and training that subconscious. Right. So the next uh, aiming style, once you actually step into the aiming is we're going to start paying attention to the tip of our arrow and that's called gap shooting. So whether you're shooting and addressing the string three under, so three fingers on the string underneath the knock. It's like you're reading or, my mind, man. That's exactly where I was headed next was like okay. three finger or three under. So yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah. So or you could go what they call split finger. That's where when you address the string, you're putting your index finger above the knock of the arrow and the in your middle and your ring finger are below the arrow. That's called split finger. Regardless of the way you approach attaching your string hand to the string and where it is in relationship to the knock, you're not gonna change that no matter what distance away from the target you are. And that would be called gap shooting. So essentially what you could, what you do to find out gap, this is, this is identical for you guys out there with compound to shooting a fixed single pin sight. Okay. So at some distance, when you draw back your compound and you look through your peep and you stick that fixed single pin sight at some distance, you're going to be what we call point on. And when you shoot, you stick the tip or the pin where it needs to go and you shoot the arrow, it, it goes exactly there. So let's just say for traditional speak, let's say that's 30 yards. Okay. So at 30 yards, all you have to do is draw back to your same repeatable anchor, whether you're shooting split finger or three under you, you squint the left eye or whatever your non-dominant eye is you're sighting down the shaft of the arrow and you stick the tip right where you want it to go. Like the crown of the tip of the arrow and you execute your shot 
30 yards, it's going to hit there. As you come back, so the arc of the arrow leaves your bow, it hits its apex halfway to the target, and it drops down and it hits right where it needs to go. Roughly halfway to that target is going to be where your maximum gap is. So what you basically do is you start, take a little piece of paper out with you, stand at the target, okay, at five yards. You're going to draw back to your anchor. You're going to stick the tip of your arrow right on the middle of that target, and you're going to shoot your shot and you're gonna get hit high. And for this example, let's say you hit high by three inches. You're gonna step back to 10 yards, same thing. Draw back, stick the tip of the arrow right on the target, shoot your shot, you're gonna get hit high by six inches. Step back to 15, do it at 20, do it at 25, and do it at 30. And by the time you get back to 30, your arrow is gonna be hitting right where that target is. So that's how you find your point on distance. You just slowly step back. But along the way, take a tape measure out there, and write down, okay, at five yards, I'm three inches high. At 10 yards, I'm six inches high. At 15 yards, I'm 10 inches high. And so now you know at 15 yards, all you have to do is draw back that bow, anchor, stick the tip of the arrow 10 inches below the target where you want it to hit and run your shot. And your arrow is going to hit right in the center of the target. And so that's gap shooting. So that's just like shooting a fixed single pin sight. Now, once you get past your point on distance, so just like in that compound, scenario you would have to start putting your your pin higher so at 35 yards you might have to put it at the top of the back of the deer and maybe at 40 yards you might be six inches above the back of the deer and so just practicing these and knowing these it becomes really instinctive so then there's this kind of middle ground between instinctive and aiming to where that's kind of where i live that's my sweet spot that's when i'm shooting the best because if i draw back and I start thinking too much like, Oh man, that deer's coming out. That looks like that's that 22 yard tree that I marked before, you know, the sun came mm -hmm, up and mm -hmm. the deer comes out. I'm like, I have 22 yards. I got to be seven inches below the chest and I draw back. And if I get, if I get too much like that, then it, it just goes away. So what I'm looking at my sight picture, that's how I approach it. It's called instinctive gap. Instinctive gap is what people call it. So you kind of draw back, you anchor, and I'm, I'm focusing on the tip of my arrow in relationship to the target. I'm looking at that, but I'm not saying I needed to put it right here based on the distance I'm at. My subconscious is kind of setting the tip where it needs to go, and I'm getting that fuzzy green light in the back of my head going, oh, yeah, that sight picture looks good. Okay, permission to move on with the rest of the shot, and then I'll go and run the rest of my shot. Right. So there's a couple different aiming, couple more aiming methods that are really applicable that are super deadly in the woods or super deadly. But one is called string walking and uh, in a podcast format, it's, it's going to be hard, hard to describe, but this is the fixed variable sight pin. So this is just a single pin slider. Okay. But instead on the front of the bow is your slider and your sight tape where you're moving this pin up and down for 20 to 80 yards, your sight tape moves to the back of the bow and it's on your tab. So I shoot with a tab versus a glove. Um, and what your tab does, there's specialized string walking tabs that have little marks, little notches grooved into the tab. And so the further down the string you go from the knock of the arrow, so you're always going to anchor in the same spot at the same time, every, every shot, no matter what. Mm -hmm. So you're going to come in your nice repeatable anchor. And let's say you're shooting three under. So your index finger is slid up the string until it bumps the knock and you draw back that knock of that arrow is going to be the furthest away from your eye. Okay. At that, mm -hmm. at that point. And so let's say your point on distance for it is the same example. Let's say it's 30 yards. If I slide down the string by an inch, take my fingers and move down below the knock by an inch. And then I anchor in the same spot that knock of the arrow now is going to be right below my eye. And so now I'm sighting down the shaft of my arrow more than what I would be if my arrow, if my fingers were up against the knock. And I just changed my point. I changed my launch trajectory just by adjusting my single pin slider, my sight mm -hmm. tape on the back of my, my, my tab of my, my, uh, my finger tab. And so I'll shoot and maybe I moved it from 30 yards to 20 yards by coming down an inch down the string. So that's how I hunt. I, I use what's called a fixed crawl. So it's blending gap shooting and string walking. So what I do is based off of my equipment, the length of my arrow, uh, how my broadheads look in my sight picture, what I like to do for whitetail hunting, it's a close hand-to-hand -hand combat sport mm -hmm. with these animals, right? I like them in my grill. I want them 12 yards or less. That's just where I'm at. And I'm, I feel comfortable shooting out to 30 yards, no problem. What I like to have is I like to have my point on distance, 
to be roughly 20 to 22 yards. And what that enables me to do is at all distances, I can have some landmark of my system on that animal at all times. So I'll describe my system to you. So I like to shoot a two blade or a three blade broadhead, but I orient the broadhead vertically in my sight picture, one of the blades vertically. And I take white, a white paint pen and I, and I, uh, paint the back side of the, that vertical blade. So it's really sticks out in low light for me. It's a single pin post site for me. Okay. Mm-hmm. So depending on where I'm crawling, let's not complicate the situation by crawling down the string and using like string walking techniques. You can do this if you're gap shooting or whatever, but what I strive with the draw weight of my bow and the mass weight of my arrows and the length of my arrows, all of these are variables to where you're going to stick the tip of your arrow, depending on the distance from the target. So I like to achieve to where when I draw back and I aim and I'm looking down the tip of my arrow, that the very tip of that broadhead blade is on where I want it to hit at 20 yards. Okay. So that's my 20 yard pin at 25 yards. I just put the center of the blade. I just raise that up to where the deer's chest is in the middle of the blade vertically Mm -hmm. from top to bottom. It's right in the middle. And then at 30 yards, I'm sticking the base of the blade right over the heart of the deer as well. But the real cool thing is, is when you're in a tree stand and this deer's under you at 12 yards. So anything under 20 yards, I'm sticking the very tip of that blade two inches below the chest. So I'm seeing just a tiny little air gap below the chest of that deer. And it's a heart shot every single time, (laughs) man. That's a, it seems like, it seems like a lot, but like, I think like once you do it, it becomes, Mm -hmm. it becomes pretty straightforward. I actually liked the idea of like the, of the string walking that to me, that to me makes a lot, a lot of sense because it's just like moving your, like, like moving your sight tape. Yeah. Only you're moving. If you, if you have a, if you have a experience with a single pin slider or you have a, like a five, like a five set of pins and there's one of them is a variable slider or whatever it is, it's, it, it works identical to that. The only caveat to that though is Every time you come down the string from a different distance. So the most accurate bare bow archers are crawling down the string for every distance. So if they're shooting a 3d tournament and they're shooting a 15 yard pig animal, right? A pig target, they're going to look at that target, do a yard adjustment for like IBO, for instance, they're going to say, okay, I think that's 15 yards. They know they have it memorized in their head. What mark on their tab is their 15 yard mark, right? No different than your sight tape on the front of your compound site. And they're going to slide their fingers down. They're going to put their thumb against that mark on the string and then they're going to slide the top of their tab down to their thumb where they had it marked and they're going to shoot the shot and that tip of their arrow is going to be right on the 11 ring of that animal for at 15 yards now if it's a 25 yard shot they have a different mark on their tab for 25 yards they're going to not going to crawl down the string as far as the 15 yard shot and this tip of their arrow is still going to be on the 11 ring so the right. advantage of string walking is your sight picture looks identical every single shot because you're sticking the tip just like a compound single pin yeah. slider. You're sticking the pin in the middle of the target on every single time. Here's the caveats that one adjusting a single pin slider compound sight is much easier in the woods with an animal approaching to, yeah, yeah. than it is bumping your tab up and trying to find that mark and sliding it down. And then what happens? I mean, it's just, it's the same issues and same caveats that you have to consider if you're running a single pin slider compound site, right? If the deer's at 20 and then it walks in and it's at 12, like, Oh crap, it, it moved. Like, did I move my site? Did I actually make the adjustment? Right. And right. so you're having to constantly reset. Um, that's why I like this kind of blended method. Also another, uh, con to string walking for bow hunting is, you can only tune your bow from one of those crawls because if your fingers are up against the knock versus your fingers are two inches below the knock, that arrow is not being drawn back as far and it changes the whole dynamics of the system. So you can only, so basically what you do when you're competing, if IBO is 33 yards and in for the bare bow class, and you think that tournament, you're like, I think the average shot distance is going to be 27 yards. You'll tune your bow at your 27 yard crawl. And then you just accept the fact that it's going to be slightely out of tune at 33 yards and slightly out of tune at those shorter distance shots as well. Right. Um, and you can get away with that with field tips. It's fine for com- competitive standpoint, but when you put a big broadhead on the yeah. front of your arrow, fixed blade broadhead, and you start shooting slightly out of tune arrows as they're clearing the bow, that's when you run into some big problems. So right. I would recommend gap shooting or running the fixed crawl method 
um, yeah. just so you're addressing the string at the same spot every single time and your bow's always in tune. Yeah. Now that you say that, it's like I almost feel like gap shooting is probably going to be my better approach mm -hmm. because it's kind of how I shoot. So I don't move my single pin on my compound. Like my single pin stays okay. fixed. Yeah, you just pin like, gap? At like 26 yards. And I know oh, yeah. based on the trajectory of my, of my compound, I know that anything under uh, 26 yards and under, I can, especially if I'm elevated, it's different if I'm on the ground, but if I'm elevated because you ha typically have to hold like a little bit high for your exit, you know, to account for the exit wound and stuff, the, uh, I can basically hold it center mass or center heart shot, if you will, right at yeah. anything under 26 yards. And if, as long as I'm elevated, it's a, it's a perfect shot. Cause I'm either going to be probably gonna be a little bit high, but I want a little bit high, you know, at, yeah, it, ta it takes that thought process in the moment of truth out. It just makes, makes that whole aiming yeah. side of the shot it's just so easy and so mindless and that's really what you want at that and yeah those type of heated moments for sure yeah and anything out to like 30 yards i know i'm going to be roughly three inches low but i'm also accounting for string jump like or the the animal to load to, mm -hmm. to move right. and so yep, i'm yep. playing with that six inch window of like kill zone that you have dude you know you're, I mean? you're yeah you are like you are talking my language because that, that's exactly how i approach shooting the recurves and and i'm always looking for how can I minimize my gaps? How can I how can I always have some land easy known landmark of my bow? That's why I orient those broadhead blades vertical. Yeah. It always gives me something that I'm referencing against that animal. That just when that animal's there, I'm like, okay, this is a close shot, two inches below the chest. Like right. I can just don't have yeah. to really think about it. It's pretty nice. Yeah. The uh, so when you get into like arrow building, man, because that that to me is like the most foreign part, right? Because like typically mm -hmm. with like a compound, you get your bow, you get whatever arrows that are spined correctly, all that stuff. Right. Yeah. But you're not so much building the arrow to like tune, like you're building an arrow to spec for like the, your draw length, the poundage that you're going to shoot, make sure it's spined correctly, et cetera. Right. And then your bow is really what you're tuning at that point. Right. It's like, you're changing like the cam lean, you're twisting the string, you're adjusting your peep, you're adjusting your center shot. Like you're adjusting all these things on the bow to account for like the, however to make the arrow fly true. But arrow building is that much, is more important. If I feel like at least I'm talking to my buddies whenever you get to traditional stuff. And so how do you go about like what I don't need, like don't have to necessarily explain like totally in depth, but just like, give me a mm. sense of like how you go about tuning an arrow, building a bow, you know, for, you know, the, the, or I'm sorry, building an arrow for the bow that you've picked. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. So in traditional archery, for the most part, if we're talking about like wood bows, three piece takedown bows, one piece long bows, whatnot, uh, it is kind of a paradigm shift to where you're tuning the arrow to the bow and not the bow to the arrow. Um, so you're exactly right. It's it's just understanding and knowing what kind of tip weight you're wanting to shoot, what length arrow you're wanting to shoot. If you're an aimer, you might want to shoot with full length arrows. So if you're getting to the point where you're like, oh man, I'm I'm getting like a like a, a weak reaction. I might need to cut some arrow length off. You might want to just jump a, a spine range, and so mm -hmm. you can keep that arrow full length and not cut it. That's I, I I never cut arrows. I try not to cut arrows. I do everything I possibly can not to cut arrows, just simply because I, the longer the arrow, the closer the 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 shorter my point on distance is going to be, and the smaller my gaps are going to be. So it's more mm -hmm. manageable in the woods. So I really like to shoot a thirty two and a half to thirty four inch arrow uh, at all times. Um, but yeah, you're, you're essentially right. It's, it's just trial and error. I mean, these companies like Lancaster, RMS gear, uh, three rivers archery, they, they do a great job of offering test kits. Um, so essentially you can just call them and get, if you, if you have an arrow build that you're interested in, you're going to shoot a black Eagle vintage or a day six arrow, you can call these companies and they'll give you a 500, a 400, a, a 340 and send them to you and then you can start your tuning process and there's a couple different methods of like bear shaft tuning or paper tuning and i'm, I'm sure a lot of guys have heard of these these methods and mm -hmm. i know you guys from a compound perspective to paper tuning is really popular um so it's it's the same process there um but it, there's it's a lot more nuanced because it's not you're not as you as the archer is the biggest variable in the entire system so yeah. when you look at a tune and it's funny we're talking about this this is going to be just a really awful awful shameless plug but we just came out with a precision tuning for the diehard bow hunter online course uh, that takes a, a hyper scientific approach to tuning traditional bows uh, we did uh, lethality studies where we asked the community to to fill out a survey on different interactions that they have after an arrow is you know strikes an animal 
Mm-hmm. And so it was a lethality study. And we found over hundreds and hundreds of data points in the traditional community that the average shot distance is 15 yards. So when you think about that being the average, over half the shots are going to be 15 down to six yards, like in this really tight range. And in your head, you're thinking, man, that that's fine. Like tune shouldn't be important because that arrow is just barely clearing the bow before it hits that animal. It's going to have all the energy in the world. Your penetration should not be an issue whatsoever, Mm -hmm. but it's actually opposite of that. The -hmm. worst penetration that we've found through these studies and through personal experience is anything that's 10 yards and under. It's because your arrows are still recovering Recovering. and paradoxing as they come out of the bow. And when they strike that animal, it's all about perfect arrow flight. And that arrow needs to strike that animal perfectly perpendicular to the line of flight, to the momentum path to get your maximum maximum downrange penetration and lethality. And so if your arrow is still paradoxing and curving and torquing on its way as it strikes that animal, you are robbing 30, 40% of your penetration wow. ability. Um, so getting a, a system and understanding how to tune these bows to the point where that arrow is flying perfect right after it clears the bow is, is paramount. And we have... Uh, high speed camera. We rented a high speed camera, and what set us down this like path to creating this online course was um, we rented a high speed camera and hung it from a ceiling, and then had a one inch grid uh, board laying flat on the on on a table, and we were shooting over top of shooting arrows over top of it. And what we were wanting to do is change all these different variables, change these arrows, and it was it was an arrow study is how it started, and we wanted to like prove or disprove whether. Uh, micro diameter arrows versus larger diameter Mm. arrows versus aluminums and carbons and tapered arrows. Like we wanted to take every arrow variable and also fletching variable and all that stuff, FOC, you name it, Mm -hmm. and try to back into what, what can get us a recovered arrow fastest. And we started finding that we were able to achieve through, not through the design of the arrow, but through the archer, the biggest Mm -hmm. variable of it, and the approach to how we tune the bow, we could get arrows perfectly fully recovered within five feet of clearing the bow. And I'm talking, you can't even see a paradox. So just maximum downrange energy. And once we started taking this approach, once we found this and took that process and applied it to our hunting bows and then went out in the field and started testing this, it's just the things that we're achieving with low 40 pound bows and under 600 grain arrows, and I know that sounds like a heavy arrow to your compound listeners, but in the traditional space, a sub 600 grain arrow is um, starting to get to the lighter side. You get to 550 grains, you're starting to be on the lighter side of the traditional community. Mm-hmm. Um, but the results that we're getting are just, they were shocking. So at that point, we we went ahead and moved forward with with creating an online course wow. um, related to tuning traditional bows. But um, the methods the methods are, making sure like for me personally i want to have the longest arrow i possibly can i want to mm-hmm. shoot the heaviest arrow i possibly can accurately and that's and that's key because we all know shooting a 700 plus grain arrow you might not be able to shoot it as accurately so go to the heaviest arrow that you can shoot accurately a, a modest foc and then good super strong component systems good super strong broadheads and you're going to be great I know we talked about a lot of nerdy stuff, right? And we tend to, and that's that's kind of the mo of our brand and and uh, and your brand, right? We and, right. And all podcasts, really. I mean, that's yeah. We, we geek love, out on specific things. We yeah. geek out on stuff, right? But at the end of the day, we wouldn't be here if our ancestors weren't walking around with traditional bows <laughs> with river cane that's arrows right. and and flint napped rocks, right? So that's right. That stuff can work, <laughs> absolutely. Right. And so right. in every spectrum in between, like the stuff that I just rattled off, all the nerdy stuff I just said, and and our ancestors and everything in between, the whole spectrum works, right? So right. if you're just if you're a hardworking person, you're detail oriented, and you just you know what you're doing you're going to be successful, whatever equipment that you pick. So I, I, I would say one big piece of advice is everything that I just said, kind of put it on the shelf for the first six months, get a bow that appeals to you, get a bow that doesn't feel awful to shoot and that you're not like sore the next morning after shooting it, like get a bow weight that you can shoot all night long and still like uh, be pissed when you're hanging the bow up because you got to go inside and tend to the kids and stuff because you want right. to keep shooting. Like that's, that's the feeling that you should have with the bow you're shooting, have this like emotional attachment to the bow and just have fun. That's, right. that's it. And then awesome. once you get to the point where you're ready for the next step, 
that's when we're here. We have stuff right. for you, right? And we, we right. can help out and get to the real nerd stuff. Nice. That's awesome, man. Well, I know we've been rattling off here for, you know, coming up on like an hour and a half. And I know you got a basketball team to take care of. So yeah, I want to be sensitive to your time uh, before I let you get out of here. Uh, yeah, let folks know where they can find out more information from the push, you know, your YouTube channel, Instagram, mm -hmm. website, podcast, all that stuff. Yep. Uh, the push archery everywhere. So Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, uh, podcast, just type in the push archery. You'll find us, uh, the push archery.com. We have a website. We have some cool products for the archery community, quivers and stuff. Um, pretty neat stuff. And then that also the website serves as a portal to an online school that we have. So we have the best coaches, minds, and champions of the traditional archery community and the barebow community. Um, we film courses with them, with these coaches and champions and, and put them into this online school, um, that you guys can purchase and, you know, work on your form, work on your mental game, work on your equipment, work on tuning. We have offerings for whatever your weakest part of your game is to, to help you maximize your opportunities for sure. Awesome, man. Well, I appreciate you coming on, dude. Everyone out there, if you're considering making the jump, they are like the one-stop shop for everything traditional archery related. You will find whatever you need there. Thank you, man. But uh, really Matt, man, I, I appreciate you coming on, dude. We'll have to do this more often. PA yeah, guys, plan, we, we, we got to stick together. Yeah, man, absolutely. Let me know if you need anything as you're trying to make the transition this summer, man. All right, folks, that is a wrap for today's show. I'd like to thank all of you for listening. And if you haven't yet, please head over to iTunes and leave us a five-star rating and be sure to subscribe to the podcast in hell. While you're at it, head over to YouTube and give us a sub there as well. I'd be super appreciative if you do those couple things for me. Before I shut this thing down, I need to give a big shout out to our partners who continue to help us make this podcast possible. Spartan Forge, Tethered, Exodus Outdoor Gear, and Genesee Beer. And until next time, we'll see y'all. Oh,